This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM This Week in Microbiology, episode 163, recorded on October 26, 2017. This episode is brought to you by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, part of the U.S. Department of Defense. The agency's chemical and biological technologies department hosts the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Find out more at cbdstconference.com. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Actually, you're not in Ann Arbor. (laughs) I'm not. I'm in our nation's capital. The um, heart of our nation, the (laughs) lifeblood, the beating heart. If if not the soul right now, but... We yeah. won't go there. We won't go there. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Do you still have 80-degree weather there? No, it, it actually became October. when It was 49 degrees as I was driving to work this morning. Yeah, but that's not typical. No, no. It, it was. It's a little cool, and I'm happy to have fall. But you have mild winters right down there. Oh, extremely mild. There have been Christmases where it's 76 degrees outside. What's it like in in D.C., Michelle? Is it nice? Yeah, I would say it's maybe mid-60s and sunny. Yeah, same here. We have a lot of clouds. Mm -hmm. I think it's low 60s here or 20 Celsius. Be scientific about, about it. It turns out that yesterday, October 25th, was the birthday of Antony von Leuvenhoek. Wow. How do you say it, Michelle? I, I try not to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and Anthony, our listener, sent a number of links from Facebook. And here's a Royal Society post known as the father of microbiology. Considered the first microbiologist was born on October 25th, 1632. Wow. Oh, Did he coin the term animacules? He yes. did indeed. He, did. he wrote a yeah. letter to the Royal Society. In September 1683, describing animalcules, first known description of bacteria. On his birthday, we unearthed exclusive photography of the letters in the original paper, dealing bacteria living in a range of environments. The colloquial diaristic style conceals the workings of a startlingly original experimental mind. You know, we used to, in the 60s and 70s, the science papers were used to be colloquial, but not anymore. If you go back and look at old papers like Journal of Virology, they're much, much different from today in terms of their writing. Not only that, but they have far fewer authors as well. Hmm. Okay, happy birthday, Antony. Do you think he's the father of microbiology? I think he was important, right? He definitely was an early leading figure. I'll give him that. Because without a microscope, right, we wouldn't be able to see them. But I think it's always more than one person. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's cool. Thank you, Anthony, for that. All right, we have uh, a snippet in a paper for you today. And the snippet is going to be published in M-Sphere, I believe, sometime early in November. By the time this episode is released, it will be published. We have it ahead of press. And um, if you remember, I am an eye editor at M-Sphere, which means that I look at the manuscripts that have been accepted and pick some for the variety of podcasts. We've done some on TWIV. We've done some here on TWIM. I don't think we have a TWIP hemisphere yet, but we're working on it. And so this one uh, was picked out in that way, and it is called Novel Genes Required for the Fitness of Streptococcus Pyogenes in Human Saliva. And today's theme of today's TWIM is saliva. <laughs> and we started with the, the, the <laughs> father of microbiology, who the first microbial sample mm-hmm. was indeed his saliva. He looked at he his scraped, saliva, huh? He, and he in fact, scraped. that's why we chose these two papers in anticipation <laughs> oh. of this <laughs> Make us look smart, Michelle. That's make right. us look smart. <laughs> uh, and organized. This paper is authored by, the first author is Lu Shang Zhu, and the last author is James Musser. And it is from... Houston Methodist Hospital, uh, Weill Medical College of Cornell University here in New York, the Animal Health Trust, which is in the UK, and the University of Cambridge, also 
course, in the UK. And uh, the, the idea here is that streptococcus, first of all, streptococcus pyogenes, a group A streptococcus, important human pathogen. Uh, the primary site of colonization is the human oropharynx. And this bacterium causes 600 million cases of pharyngitis annually worldwide, 15 million in the U.S., and big health care costs. And it's also responsible for 100 million cases of other human infections. So the, the initial colonization of the oropharynx, and then it goes elsewhere and includes rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, which is very bad, the most common cause of preventable pediatric heart disease globally. We don't understand how this bacterium successfully colonizes the mouth, causes pharyngitis, and persists. And that's partly what this person, uh, what this person, what this paper is addressing. They would like to know how, what genes are important for strep pyogenes to be able to persist in saliva. And saliva, of course, is something that we produce in our mouths that we swallow. And you'll hear more about that from our paper today. Uh, but the question here is, how does this bacterium uh, persist in saliva? And if I could interject, this mm -hmm. is um, a topic that this group has been working on for a, a while. They did a nice job in their introduction describing some of the background work, including identifying a two a key two-component regulatory system that's important for group A strep to persist in saliva. And this two-component regulatory system they named as a strep pyogenes transcriptional regulator and sensor, and the acronym is SPTR slash S or spitters. Here it comes. <laughs> you like that, don't you? Yeah. Spitters. Spitter and spittus. Spitters. Spits. Spitter and spittus. That's great. Spits. Yeah. Uh, so you know, who says microbiologists aren't witty and, and have a sense of humor? I do have a sense of humor. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> spitters. Saliva and spit. Oh, that's just great. You know, actually, I didn't, I hadn't picked that up. Did you, yeah, Michael? That would be on, that would be on oh, line yeah. 110, wow. 110 and yeah, 111. I of see the... it now. I, I tend to look at these acronyms and go rapidly by them. I guess I you should. You don't pronounce them out loud. I don't pronounce them out loud. You're right. So they definitely uh, tailored that. Okay. Yeah, I don't think that was a coincidence. No, 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 no. Definitely mm. not. Well, when you can, make an interesting acronym. That's true. We'll try and make a title that includes that, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I wonder what genes spitters regulate. I wonder if there there's a way to figure that out, Vincent. I, I think you probably could, right? How? <laughs> Which is the intent of the paper. Well, here's the paper. So the idea here would be to make a, a lot of gene mutations in this bacterium and ask which genes are important for the ability to grow in saliva. And so they make a transposon insertion library where you, you in introduce into the bacterium a plasmid, including the transposon, which will then integrate randomly in the DNA, and then it will copy itself and integrate somewhere else and hop around. And this is a common way to make random mutations in many, many genes. And in fact, they start, so they start with a stream of strep pyogenes and they generate 140,000 plus unique transposon insertions. That was amazing. And how do they know that? <laughs> well, well, I think there, there are a couple of ways you could do it, but probably sequencing would tell you that, right? And that's what they did, that's yeah, for this method. Did. So it's kind of a next generation of signature tag mutagenesis. Right. They actually sequenced out from each transposon and then could therefore map yeah, each transposon right. to the site. And I think they said on average they had a transposon every like 13, 17, 13 nucleotides. So. Yeah. Saturation. And 93% uh, of the genes, 1,720 out of 1,841, have at least one transposon insertion. Amazing. So they have, a, they have pools of colonies with these mutations, and then they can ask who can grow well in the presence of saliva. So the way they do this, they mix, they get saliva from human volunteers, and they mix it with uh, bacteria, uh, and then they plate it on agar. And they look at 12, 24, and 48 hours later after growth on the agar. After, so mix with the saliva, put it on agar, and then 12, 24, and 48 hours. You then scrape off whatever's growing, and you sequence, and you see what genes have decreased frequency in the population. In other words, the bacteria aren't growing as well as you would expect them to. And so you can look at this entire library and ask, 
what's needed to grow in saliva. I should say, and I might be wrong here, but these are not necessarily specific for saliva, right? But they're needed to grow in saliva. True. Because they didn't look to see if they would affect growth in other conditions, non-saliva conditions. But Yeah, like they didn't do a counter screen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, they had 140,000 clones, so let's not quibble. No, it's okay, but they do focus in on a few at the end. At yeah. some point, they're going to have to do that, right? It's an interesting question to know if there are any saliva-specific genes, right? So they identified uh, 92 genes whose disruption by a transposon affects growth in human saliva. And these contain genes, three prevalent categories, genes involved in carbohydrate transport and metabolism, amino acid transport and metabolism, and inorganic ion transport and metabolism. There are others as well, but those were the major three category. And they had previously done some work addressing the same question with non-human primates, cinnamalgus macaques. And they asked what genes are expressed during oropharyngeal infection of these animals. And of the 92, what they call saliva fitness genes that they identify in this paper, 74% of them were also expressed during infection of these macaques, oropharyngeal infection. So that's good. You're hitting that does speak a little bit to your question. Right. They are Although expressed. Although it doesn't doesn't rule out that it's specific or document yeah. that it's specific for saliva. So the next thing they do is they pick six genes and uh, these are genes that have not been shown to participate in saliva fitness. And they are in the core of all the known group A strep genomes. And they were expressed in the oral pharynx of these non-human primates. And they're involved in a variety of pathways, including uh, transporters, carbohydrate metabolism, pyrimidine and arginine synthesis, amino acid metabolism, and phosphate transport. So they take a, a, a parental strain, they inactivate, again, each of these genes specifically. So now you have a, an isogenic strain, you have the parent, and you have a mutant strain. And this, they confirm that, in fact, disruption of these genes cause reduction of growth uh, in saliva, impaired fitness in saliva, uh, I should say. But they don't, and here that would have been a nice time since there are only six compare growth in, I don't know, rich medium or something else, right? Or Yeah, I think they did say that they don't have growth defects in overall, rich medium, yeah. but that doesn't get at your question of whether they're specifically induced. Yeah. Uh, so these genes are in all, as I said, they're all, all these uh, group A strep genomes that have been sequenced. They're highly conserved in terms of where they are located. The sequence is conserved. And they're also, uh, this, this, these ABC transporter genes, in fact, they're downstream from uh, another gene, CAR-B, that they, sh- that they uh, have shown to be important for uh, fitness and, in fact, is one of these that they've specifically disrupted. Uh, CAR-B encodes a carbamoyl phosphate synthetase, and that compound is a precursor for pyrimidine and arginine synthesis. And uh, then another gene that they looked at, PSTS, uh, which you could probably pronounce in a way that revokes, invokes spitting of some way. <laughs> it encodes a pho- phosphate binding protein involved in phosphate uptake. So you see all of these are involved in uh, transport acquisition of nutrients and metabolism. And I suppose that that's the bottom line here is that these may enable the bacteria to acquire nutrients in the oral cavity, right? And of course, now you go on, you have to go on and figure out exactly what they're doing and how specific they are and so forth. But now we have this uh, library of mutants that uh, people can use to study uh, persistence in the oral cavity uh, and function and so forth. So this is actually a perfect snippet because there's no mechanism here. There's suggestions, of course, but it's the first step. It's also a really great illustration of the power of this library and this new method that they applied. This yeah. trot, trotis, is that how we pronounce that? Transpose on with good. deep sequencing? Works for me, yeah. And again, the idea is that you simply sequence after your selection to see the representation of the genes. So you can look mm-hmm. at the whole, the whole population. They did this, in, did this in pools, so you could look at the whole population. It's very good. Yeah, and then deduce who's needed. Right. Anything that's missing must have been important. So I yeah so that's a cool paper. Any other thoughts, Michael? Did you? Uh, I I like I'd like to commend them on their figures. And even though this is only audio, you'll be able to see these figures because M Sphere 
is actually published in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually take a look at their figures. And the one that I was most intrigued with is the one that has the Venn diagram in it, where you have overlapping circles and you can begin to see which genes are overlapping with between 12 and and 24 and 48 hours. And you can see which ones are common. And I found that figure especially compelling and most easy to digest Mm -hmm. as we were going through this great paper in terms of, you know, just the sheer volume of materials that they that they were looking at. And this is going to give them, I think, some insight into uh, how this organism is able to account for as many infections as it does indeed cause. Uh, throughout the globe. Is that, do you know, there must be inhibitors of bacteria in saliva, right? Yeah, there are. Peptides and so forth, right? Peptides, uh, all sorts of other things. Uh, uh, some of the uh, salivary proteins and, you know, it's a complex milieu controlling the the dynamics of, of the microbes. And, you know, you don't consider group A strep as being predominant organism in the oral cavity, but it is in the oral pharynx. Mm -hmm. And uh, mostly when you think of the oral cavity, you're thinking of strep mutans and and some of the more uh, common karyogenic microbes. But here, again, the genes that were important for fitness were principally associated with carbohydrate metabolism. And And if you think about it, that's exactly what streptococci are doing to initiate the karyogenic response or cause cavities. And for better or worse, the most prevalent infection on the globe is caries, uh, Hmm. infecting our teeth with uh, streptococci responsible for, you know, dissolving the wondrous crystal hydroxyapatite that is our tooth. (laughs) So I didn't see any genes that would be involved in resistance to, say, peptides or other inhibitors. However, uh, quite a number of genes that were disrupted have an unknown function. So maybe they could be involved in, a, you know, resistance mm-hmm. to an antimicrobial peptide, for example. I also appreciated that um, they, the point they made in their discussion that this really emphasizes the intimate linkage between metabolism and persistence. Mm-hmm. So in the early days of, of microbial pathogenesis, we tended to fixate on secreted proteins that were easy to get our hands on and, and study biochemically like toxins, and then studying factors that, as you pointed out, overcome the immune system. But the ability to grow is obviously really important for any infection. And we're learning that more and more as we use these whole genome methods for identifying key pathways that uh, microbes need to establish infection. So we're having to go back to our microbial metabolism to understand infection. Michael, what fraction of the population carries uh, strep pyogenes in the oropharynx? You know, I think everyone, everyone does. Okay. Every, everyone does. It's, it's quite common. And I think Michelle brings up a, a really interesting point about the genesis of uh, how we began to dissect uh, pathogenesis. When we began to look at pathogenesis, it was always pure culture biology. And today, because of our advances in sequencing technology, we know that nothing occurs in the pure state of a single organism in the context of the host. It's it's a very complex dynamic that we have in the oropharynx and oral cavity, and the two are indeed connected. So yeah. what's what's going on that these authors are trying to elicit and, and thinking about the genes that were revealed that were important for the strep to be able to compete in this dynamic equilibrium where we feed them on an irregular schedule. And if you eat between meals, you're, you're changing the sugar balance and you're doing all sorts of unique things to the carbohydrate mix. It's, it's really this technique and the mutants or the transposons that they have generated will really begin to help them take things apart. And as you point out, we don't understand how this microbe is responsible for the rheumatic events that we see, which are not an infection, but a reaction to our immune system is reacting to a protein of the microbe that happens to cross react with one of our heart proteins. And it's a a secondary. So 
it's it's really pretty neat that they're offering this technology to the greater community to begin to think about how to dissect some of these things. Yep. And presumably their two component regulatory system spitters <laughs> will help. Bitters. Oh no, and and that's <laughs> I think is the key is the two component system of of what's turning certain genes on and off in the context of where the organism is. Spitters and saliva, right? Yep. It's a good mm-hmm. title. They're linked. <laughs> Can't have one without the other. You cannot. Let me tell you about the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Imagine an everyday inexpensive drone you could buy online, modified by terrorists to spread chemical or biological weapons over a crowded football stadium or a holiday parade. Plague, VX, sarin, weaponized flu. How could we prevent a scenario like this from happening? How would we treat the victims? How would we counter the effects? Join us in Long Beach, California, November 28th through 30th for the 2017 Chemical and Biological Defense Science and Technology Conference to exchange information on the latest and most dynamic developments for countering chemical and biological weapons of mass destruction. Collaborate with over 1,500 scientists, subject matter experts, military service members, industry partners, and academic leaders from across the globe who are committed to making the world safer by confronting chem-bio defense challenges. Part of the U.S. Department of Defense and charged with safeguarding our warfighters and our nation, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency's Chemical and Biological Technologies Department hosts this important conference and brings together the best and brightest from around the world. Please join us to share your important ideas. For more information and to register for the meeting, you can go to cbdstconference.com and you can stay up to date with the latest conference information on Facebook. Just search for D-O-D-D-T-R-A. And on Twitter, CBDST Conference, the 2017 CBDST Conference, today's innovation, tomorrow's warfighter capabilities. Continuing with saliva, Michael has a paper to tell us all about. And this is uh, a paper that appeared in last Friday's Science Magazine, and it's entitled The Ectopic Colonization of Oral Bacteria in the Intestine drives TH1 cell induction and inflammation. And it's authored by 26 individuals. (laughs) And that should give you an idea of how intense this paper actually is. It's, It's only got four figures, but it's got a tremendous amount of supplemental information that I think as you begin to unpack this paper, you will find very rewarding because they're easy experiments to understand and you can actually understand the logic flow uh, behind how they came to the conclusion that is really summed up in the title of this paper. Hey, Michael, four figures, but they have like 10 panels each or more. (laughs) This is true. This is this is true. They're, they're, They're very intense. So here's the bottom line up front for this very cool study, which is a cross between a paper for this week and microbiology and, and if you will, our, our initial foray into this week in immunology. So the intestinal colonization by bacteria of oral origin has been correlated with several negative health outcomes, including inflammatory bowel disease. And as everyone knows, since we just left talking about strep pyogens with in the oral cavity. The oral cavity is a very complex habitat with over 600 prevalent taxa at the species level and that the average human will consume about one and a half liters of their own saliva per day. And if you recall that saliva has a concentration of 10 to the 9 bacteria per mil, that means you are literally consuming 1.5 1.5 times 10 to the 12 bacteria from your oral cavity, and they're ending up in your GI tract each day. Michael, now, this, is that for people who floss or people who don't floss? <laughs> it's, it's for everyone because the flossing, the flossing, this is a, I, I spent last week at the American Dental Association. So that's why I threw this paper over the transom. I was with a bunch of dentists last week. And um, it it was actually a a fascinating meeting. And um, as I was sitting in one of the meetings, I was looking through the titles of science, and that's how I stumbled into this. 
but it is indeed true. And what flossing does is it tightens up your periodontum so that you don't get as many microbes in the pockets. That's what flossing is good for. So the causal role of oral bacteria that are ectopically, and, and ectopically means that these organisms are in the wrong spot. And the causal role of the oral bacteria colonizing the intestine remains unclear. But what these authors did was they use notobiotic techniques, which are effectively animals that are raised in the absence of, of uh, normal microbial constituents. And they showed that strains of Klebsiella isolated from the salivary microbiome were strong inducers of Th1 helper cells when they colonized the gut. And that these Klebsiella strains were resistant to multiple antibiotics and they only tended to colonize the intestine when the intestinal microbiota was dysbiotic, that it was disturbed. And then that, then this elicited this severe gut inflammation in the context of a genetically susceptible host. And so their findings are extremely intriguing that suggest that the oral cavity may serve as a reservoir for a potential intestinal pathobinant. And this is a word I never heard of before, and I may <laughs> be pronouncing it wrong. And these are microbes that are proposed as pathobionts are associated with chronic inflammatory conditions. And unlike opportunistic pathogens, which often cause acute infections, like Michelle was talking about in the early days of pathogenesis, we were always looking at the acute infection. These things are typically acquired from the environment or other parts of the body. So I, I learned a new word, the pathobinant, <laughs> and, and they can exasperate intestinal disease. And any of you who are listening, who know people who have Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disorder or any of the other inflammatory conditions associated with the digestive system, you know how devastating these diseases can be. So any insight that we may gather from looking at this can, can you know, help us out. And so as background for some of our, our listeners who may not be the card-carrying immunologist, I found a handy cheat sheet that I'm going to ask Ray to put in the show notes so you can figure out the importance of various T cells as we begin to talk about the immunology. And it's by Chen Dong and Gustavo Martinez that was published in Nature Immunology Reviews and it's, and it's freely available so it's not behind the Nature paywall. So you're able to download it and delve into what all these magical T cells do as you're reading the literature or just listening to uh, uh, a twiv or a twim or a twip where we begin to go down the immunology path. So I thought I'd put that out there. So broadly speaking, T cells can be grouped into various subsets based on their effector functions and molecular phenotype. And they function by directly secreting soluble mediators or through cell contact dependent mechanism. And there may be various transcription factors. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the one that we're going to focus on in today's discussion is the T helper one cell or TH1 cell. And as you will see from the cheat sheet or poster, it's got a whole variety of receptors, but we're not going to talk about them. It's got transcription factors. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to talk about the things that it secretes, namely the interferon gamma, which is the soluble dimerized cytokine that is critical for innate and adaptive immunity against viral and some bacterial and protozoal infections will activate macrophages. But for our discussion today, you need to appreciate that too much interferon gamma is associated with a number of these auto-inflammatory or autoimmune diseases. So that's one of the things that they're measuring, and they're doing that by flow cytometry, where they're harvesting the effector molecules, the, the white blood cells, if you will. They're running them through a, a fax machine, which will be able to tell how many are there, and they're able to tag them as to whether or not they're indeed producing interferon gamma. So the story starts 
with the authors mining their in-house data sets of 16S ribosomal RNA sequences, asking who's present in the oral cavity. And what they learned is that there were several species. There were things like Rothia, Streptococci, Neisseria, Prevotella, Gamella, all of which are aerotolerant microbes. And they were significantly more abundant in patients with ulcerative colitis, primary uh, sclerosing cholangitis, gastroesophageal reflux diseases, which is you probably heard of as GERD. And they also found it associated with alcoholism as well. And so that's the effective part of their first story. They display the aggregate relative abundance of these microbes. And what you see is healthy individuals have little blips of, of bacteria. They're, they're not anything one over the other. But as you go into these inflammatory things, you see spikes of things popping up. And, and these things, Michael, just to be clear, are microbes that are normally in the oral cavity, but they're popping up in the gut of these in the gut. patient populations. So a healthy individual has a diverse community in their stool. Not anyone is sticking out like a sore thumb. But in, the, uh, in these chronic inflammatory conditions, there are organisms that actually pop up and become as high as 55% in the ulcerative colitis. So you can see uh, in this particular figure of, of who's actually popping up. And then this takes us to the, the premise of their work or their hypothesis, namely that a subset of the oral microbes may supplant themselves from the oral cavity and colonize and persist in the intestine under certain circumstances to then aberrantly activate the intestinal immune system, resulting in these chronic inflammatory diseases that we just listed. And they tested this hypothesis using an elegant approach of simply taking transplanted saliva samples from patients with Crohn's disease, and they actually then placed them into C57 black black six germ-free mice, and they just simply gavaged it in. So in other words, they collected the saliva from the patient, and then they just pipetted it down the throats of these uh, mice or by gavage. And then each mouse was housed in a separate notobiotic isolator because remember, mice eat their own stool. So the stool is infectious, so you can move organism around. So they try to control for this. And then after six weeks of allowing the oral gavaged microbes to effectively take hold, they then sampled the small intestine and colonic lamia propria, and the immune cells were examples examined. And in the mice receiving a saliva sample from a Crohn's disease patient, there was no significant changes to the intestinal cells. And they only did two saliva samples, which is really remarkable. But in the second patient, there was a profound difference. And the profound difference is we saw this spike of interferon gamma producing CD4 positive cells, namely these T helper one T cells in the intestinal lamia propria. And their next step was then to figure out what was unique about the community of microbes present in the saliva associated with patient number two. And here again, they go back to 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequencing, and they compared the community composition of the saliva microbes before administration into the germ-free mice and then the fecal microbiota of the colonized individuals. And they create a very colorful plot. And although the saliva samples of both patients contain similar microbial communities, the fecal samples differed markedly between saliva one sample, which showed no interferon gamma, and saliva two that had a boatload of the stuff in there. And they then learned what was unique to saliva number two sample, which was only a minor component of the salivary microflora, offering them their first insight into how the oral microbiome could be implicated in disease that this bacterial species 
only that was constituting a small fraction of the oral cavity could expand and colonize in the gut. And a subset of these oral species could then induce the accumulation of the intestinal Th1 cells. Well, um, so far, we just have correlations though, right? Right. Cause and effect, hmm. we we don't get at just yet. So the next step they're going to do is they're going to try to go after Michelle's fulfilling Koch's postulates. And so they they wanted to isolate the Th1 cell-inducing bacteria. So they anaerobically cultured the cecal contact. And that's very important because most of the organisms in the digestive system of animals are anaerobes. So you don't want to cultivate them aerobically. You want to cultivate them anaerobically. And they cultivated them and they picked 224 different colonies with different colony appearances. They then sequenced them to learn their identities and they learned that the colonies contained eight strains from diverse genera. We had gamella, which is again an oral flora organism. We had bifidobacterium, streptococcus, escherichia, fusobacterium, vianella, anaerococcus, as well as klebsiella. These eight broadly represented the major members of the gut microbiota colonizing the gut from saliva sample number two. So next on our path to address Michelle's question, to demonstrate the causal relationship between disease was to ask how these isolated strains had a Th1 cell-inducing capability. And again, they just simply looked for the production of this interferon gamma. So they cultured these eight groups separately, made a cocktail, introduced them into the germ-free mice, and asked did it recapitulate the original observation of the saliva experiment. So instead of having the complex mixture from saliva, they just grew up these eight organisms, mixed them all together, fed them back to the mice, and they observed the efficient induction of Th1 cells in the colonic uh, lamellae appropriate of the mice with a magnitude comparable to what they originally saw. So again, it's still correlative, as Michelle would say. So then the authors asked you to compare panel B and panel D, and they they do indeed look remarkably similar. And the first author, Koji Atarash, Atarashi, um, told me that was an especially exciting day in the lab when they got plotted out that data and found when they started with a really complex sample from saliva of a patient and then in a matter of, I don't know, weeks, yes. were able to identify a particular bacterium from saliva that accounted for this spike in interferon gamma production. And Michelle sort of tumbled to their their result because they, they did a bunch of other experiments ruling out fusobacterium and viomella because these two microbes were implicated in inflammatory bowel disease pathogenesis. And they didn't do much of anything. They didn't induce the interferon gamma. And what they ended up discovering is there was one microbe, Klebsiella pneumoniae, 2H7, that was responsible for this interferon gamma spike. And they did the appropriate uh, control experiment where they had seven organisms without the Klebsiella, and they were able to illustrate that look just like a germ-free animal's normal gut lamia propria. So you can understand how they were most ex- excited. And the effect of this Klebsiella, or they abbreviated KP2H7, was relatively specific for Th1 cells. And they they have a tremendous number of supplemental figures, but it really takes you through the story. What was remarkable is that there was no increase in the percentage of Th1 cells in the oral tissues, that either the palate or the mm. tongue. And that's where this microbe came from. Remember, it came from the saliva of a patient with uh, Crohn's disease. And the increase in Th1 cells was observed in another strain of mice. And here's where they demonstrate that it's dependent upon the genetics uh, of the host. And so there are two other strains that it recapitulated the results in, and those are hidden in the uh, supplemental figures that you can take a look at. But now the question is, 
how is it able to establish itself? And here's where the microbiology comes into play. As our listeners know, Klebsiella is a notorious microbe, often requiring resistance to multiple antibiotics, with the scariest one now being KPC, which is the Klebsiella pneumonia that has a carbapenemase resistance factor in it. Here, their isolate, KP2H7, was resistant to a multiple antibiotics, including ampicillin, tylosin, that many of you may not have heard of because it's typically not used in people. This is a feed additive that they use for supplementing the diet of animals to lessen the farm to table time. And it's, it's nothing more than a macrolide. The organism was also resistant to spectinomycin, which is an aminoglycoside, and it was also resistant to metroniazole. So that's a pretty broad list of antibiotics. So their next experiment was to ask whether or not the animal's gut was required to be dysbiotic. That is to say it was disrupted in order for the Klebsiella to display the normal flora and then effectively bloom and recruit the Th1 cells. And you, the experiment, as you might imagine, was using now the normal normal mice, as we would call them in the lab, or specific pathogen-free mice, which have a normal immune system, a normal digestive tract. They have their full complement of bacteria, and they were untreated or continuously treated with ampicillin, tylosin, spectinomycin, or metrozyanol in the drinking water for four days before the oral gavage of the Klebsiella pneumonia. And the antibiotic-naive mice were resistant to colonization by the Klebsiella, but the AMP-treated or the tylosin-treated animals allowed the KP287 to persist within the animal's intestines. But the uh, spectinomycin and metronidazole, it didn't matter. The organism wasn't able to displace it. So it was unique to those two antibiotics, AMP and tylosin. And they, they show a nice figure clearly delineating what actually is going on. And the percentage of Th1 cells amongst the colonic lamiel propria was analyzed again by flow cytometry, and they're able to recapitulate that is indeed in the presence of the tylosin or the ampicillin, they're still generating the same level of interferon gamma production that was uh, going on. And the reason I'm taking you through this first figure so carefully is they replicate this experiment, the this series of experiments throughout the paper in order to get at their their final conclusion. But before before you go on, I've I found it really interesting that treatment with two antibiotics allowed this Klebsiella to colonize, but the other two did not. And they were able to deduce from that that there must be some species of antibiotics normally in the gut that provide resistance. And if they get wiped out by a particular drug, then the Klebsiella can establish a foothold. So I think that's going to give them an um, entree into figuring out what microbes in the healthy gut prevent these Klebsiella from the mouth from getting in there and, and causing problems. So that I found that hopeful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is very important as we're trying to begin to understand this whole genesis of these inflammatory digestive diseases. And so how you're do we protect ourselves. We can't just keep taking antibiotics to get rid oh, of these no. Klebsiella in the mouth. So what other levers do we have to pull? So And it's about this dynamic equilibrium that's actually indeed going on. And the authors contribute that because microbial and host factors both contribute to pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease, they then took them to test the influence of this Klebsiella colonization strain in the colitis-prone mouse, which is an IL-10 knockout animal. So here the experiment was a germ-free wild-type mouse along with the knockout, and they were each orally administered either the Klebsiella pneumonia strain or an E. coli strain or a mixture of the other six strains. 
And as you know, both Klebsiella and E. coli are members of the Enterobacteriaceae family, and both have been implicated in IBD pathogenesis. So here, they learned from this particular experiment, one week after colonization, again, a more potent induction of the Th1 cells was observed in the knockout animals, given the uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, than in the other groups. And there was a greater induction of the colonic LP, IL-17 positive, interferon gamma positive CD4 T cells, as well as uh, epithelial tumor necrosis factor and mRNA expression in the knockout animals. And here, the histological evaluation illustrated that KP, this Klebsiella pneumonia that was prone to colonization induced a more severe inflammation than the E. coli or the six mix in the proximal colon of these knockout animals. So again, the data affiliated with this first figure and the supplemental data they've been displaying all along as they're taking you through this story led the authors to propose slash conclude that this Klebsiella 2H7 acts as, a, as this gut pathobinant in the context of this genetically susceptible host. And organisms proposed as these pathobinants are then associated with this chronic inflammatory condition, unlike the opportunistic pathogens, which often cause just simply an acute if- infection. I think so, it's important to point out that up to this experiment, you know, the, the Klebsiella could recolonize and induce TH1s, but they didn't cause inflammatory changes right. in, in wild-type mice. Only when you look at these knockouts does that happen, which is really and, interesting. And so yeah. they're beginning to they're beginning to take they're sneaking the immunology into into their story uh, on this because you know the beauty of using the notobiotic mice is that we do have a large family of knockout animals from which. Mm we can begin to dissect, is it the host immune system or is it the organism itself going on? Because, you know, it's a complex mixture in in the gut of of microbes and you don't know if it's the KP or some other minor actor, but it's still, you know, the the Klebsiella pneumonia is really beginning to to do this thing. And so that's where they take but, us. But, but, but in a, in a healthy gut, you've got plenty of, of good microbes yeah, that won't yeah. let the Klebsiella in. And then we've got cells that make this cytokine IL-10 that dampen the immune response. Exactly. So exactly. normally we're protected, yep. but and I that's agree the that, beauty of IL-10. Yeah, right. And that's why you can, you can swallow 10 to the 12 bacteria a day. Right. And you're okay. And, <laughs> and I'd have a chronically inflamed, uh, yeah. system. Mm. And, you know, they, they take us through and they show uh, through some beautiful uh, immunofluorescence that this, this KP2H7 isn't invading. It's um, not invading the system. And, and, and then they do a really neat experiment where they use heat-killed KP2H7. Again, this is, you know, if it's just an antigen response where mm. you're throwing in all these things, but there is actually biology going on because what they were able to show in that particular experiment using dead KP and live KP, only the live KP induced increase in interferon producing um, gamma CD4 positive T cells. And so it's actually very satisfying to see what's actually going on with that particular system. Now, the intensity of induction was independent of bacterial load and was not accompanied by inflammation. And they have a grading scale of Th1 induction of strong, medium, and weak. And then they began to correlate via multilocus sequence typing, K-typing, or simply phylogeny And again, this is buried in the supplemental tables of what genes are responsible or what's actually going on. And 
Um, and this is bacterial genes. These right? are bacterial genes. Bacterial genes. genes. Mm -hmm. And the comparative analysis of the whole genomes revealed that 61 orthologous groups of genes were possibly correlated with the Th1 induction. So we have 61 groups of genes, uh, and these included genes to encode a homolysin correlated co-regulated protein, enzymes involved in fructose, galactose, mannose, and long chain fatty acid metabolism, related uptake and metabolic pathways. And so you can see this, this is not a simple throw a club CL in and see what happens. It's the, this organism is, is, is unique to being able to cause this sort of pathology. And these genes have been purported to be enriched in the fecal microbiome of patients with patients with inflammatory disease and have been suggested to have immunomodulatory effects and thereby may contribute to the induction of the Th1 cells, which Michelle, you know, sort of stumbled into in the beginning. She says, is there going to be hope for us? And so then they take us down the path again, trying to drive home the Koch postulus to confirm the link between oral derived bacteria and Th1 induction. They obtained additional saliva samples, but now this time from two healthy donors and two patients with active ulcerative colitis. Rather than Crohn's disease, we're now looking at ulcerative colitis. And they again re-ran the experiments that we just talked about. And they ran these in germ-free wild type B6 mice. And as you might expect, the Th1 cells accumulated in the colonic uh, lamia propria of mice inoculated with a saliva sample from the ulcerative colitis colitis patient. And it was, again, only one particular patient showed up. And so it's, it's not cause and effect. It's, it's, you know, not all saliva samples will have one of these unique microbes. That was a, that was the healthy patient, right? Yeah. And there was one that was a healthy patient. There yeah. was one with an ulcerative colitis and there was one from a healthy patient. So healthy patients that don't yet have this disease, you can be swallowing this organism, but unless you have a dysbiotic event mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. some triggering event, and that's what we don't know is going on. And the paper takes us through more uh, of this rerunning it, and they fished out a strain like the first experiment they they cultured the sequel contents the same way anaerobically from the inducer strain. They isolated 13 strains. They orally administered them. So there, you now understand why there's 26 authors. There's an incredible amount of work. They replicated the phenotype they saw for the ulcerative colitis patients in terms of Th1 induction. And then among the 13 strains they recovered, they found one that was an Enterococcus fecium and a Klebsiella aeromobilis. And that drew their attention because both of those microbes have been implicated in IBD pathogenesis and been reported to be important multidrug resistant pathobinants. And again, following the routine of germ-free mice gavaged with either Enterococcus fecium or the Klebsiella aeromobilis or a mixture of the 11 other strains, they confirmed that it was the Klebsiella aeromobilis that induced the Th1 cells in the colon comparably to the 13 mix, whereas the Enterococcus fecium and the 11 mix failed to do so. And so that takes us through their third set of figures. And then as they begin to wrap up their story, they uh, talk about, they analyzed this new species of Klebsiella and learned that its colonization resulted in severe inflammation in the IL-10 knockout mice, suggesting that this orally derived strain may act similarly to KP2H7. And likewise, the Aeromobilis Klebsiella did not attach to the surface 
And again, they demonstrated that by the same fish technology that they used in the first figure. And so their outlier, as Vincent already tumbled into, was their discovery that the healthy donors also could have one of these bad actors. And they isolated this strain, and it was a Klebsiella pneumoniae strain, KP40B3. And this strain also induced marked T-cell accumulation in the colon of, of the mice. And their final experiment was they mined the 16S RNA uh, sequencing data sets used in the analysis of figure one and found that the relative abundance of members of the Klebsiella were significantly higher in patients with Crohn's disease, this cholangitis, alcoholism, and they're contrasting with the control group. And then they went off to uh, other databases looking at inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease, respectively, from the Mass Gen Hospital PRISM database. And the Crohn's disease from was from the University of Pennsylvania cohort. And again, they see that this Klebsiella actor is, is a, a bad actor. So summing up. Let me just let me just say that. That's that experiment is so important because, you know, it's OK in mice to show that these clebs do something. But if people with the disease don't have them, that would really be the end of it. Right. Absolutely. And so that's key that these people with, you know, CD, alcoholism, et cetera, have these strains. Um, and I thought it was really impressive that we have these two public databases. Yeah, that's pretty um, cool. So right? these are, as they say, they're these registries where they have now cataloged who is in the gut microbiota of patients with IBD or with um, ulcerative colitis. And now anybody can query those and, and learn something more. So it's, yep. it's really yep. a tribute to, um, to public research. And the, the, the subtlety is, is they use the, the man Whitney test uh, <laughs> to do the statistics. And that means that they're not normally distributed. So again, this is why in not all saliva samples from patients with this disease had this particular microbe or this particular family. So we don't know as there might, Elio would. There might be others, right? There might be others. So if we you don't took, have maybe them. if you had all these salivas, like dozens, you'd find other bacteria that could do right. a similar thing. Mm, almost certainly. Yeah. And then that, that'd be interesting to see if there, it's a different bacterium of a different name, but it still has that subset of metabolic pathways. Mm-hmm. That I they bet, pulled out. I bet yeah. it did. I bet it does, yeah. And that's that's the power of this paper is is they had a readout for the immune system responding, namely the production of the interferon gamma that was fairly replicative. And they had this power of DNA sequencing and they did the mixing and matching experiments to demonstrate, or if you will, fulfill the Koch's postulate that this organism alone was the actor or triggering event that actually uh, caused it. And, you know, their concluding statement, the data suggests that the oral cavity may serve as a reservoir for Klebsiella pathobinance. In a point of fact, the oral cavity or its microbiota contains the highest relative abundance of the Enterobacteriaceae compared with other mucosal sites. And so, you know, it, it may not always be Klebsiella. It may be one of the other Enterobacteriaceae species that, as Michelle said, have this cluster of genes that can actually trip this expansion of these Th1 helper cells that produce these inflammatory mediators. You think, Michael, if you, you have patients with these diseases and you find that they have these Klebsiella, you think, as they, they suggest, get rid of them with therapeutics – could that correct the disease? You know, well, is, it, is it a matter of continuous infusion of these Klebsiella's into the gut or, you know, where once you stop, uh, it's then the, the inflammation goes away or is it just a trigger and it goes on on its own? Well, that's the autoimmune part is, you know, yeah. once you have trained the immune system to react, it will react because it is the adaptive arm of the immune system and it has memory. I guess you could do a clinical trial and just treat people to eliminate the Klebsiella and see if it corrects their IBD or whatever else, right? And this is where I think um, 
when I was at the American Dental Association meeting last week, there were a number of vendors selling probiotics for the oral cavity yeah. <laughs> that were specifically, you know, you would ingest these organisms. So you would, you know, pop the pill and they were enterically coated so they could withstand the stomach acid. But, you know, you're, you're adding these organisms to your gut. And I don't, I didn't quite get the connection of how organisms in the gut were going to connect back to to the mouth because I always, I hope it's a one way trip. You know, you eat something, it goes down, yeah. and it goes out. I I don't try to regurge my food. I'm not unlike a cow. Uh, I'm not you know chewing my cud. So I'll also say the idea that we should just get rid of the bacteria that just seems like hopeless. <laughs> Instead, I, I love the idea of figuring out which microbes in our gut uh, provide colonization yeah. resistance. Yeah. And then by, by changing our diet and making sure that we have those microbes, we can just have be naturally protected. And that's actually the, the route that um, Koji said they're, they're most interested in pursuing now is trying to identify which beneficial bacteria in the healthy gut um, prevented these Klebsiella from triggering the Th1 inf- interferon gamma production as a, as a step toward therapy. I think that uh, I think that you're absolutely right, but it's a long term thing because a lot it of these is. gut microbes aren't easily cultured, right? In the meantime, right. people with a- IBD would like to have some relief, so maybe maybe yeah. the antibiotic treatment is uh, or fecal transplants, yeah. and we'll figure out later yeah. who's doing it. Yeah. So Koji um, is an, uh, on the faculty member now, but let me tell you his um, background. He got his bachelor's of science at Kyoshi University in Japan in the School of Sciences and then did his PhD at Osaka University where he began to study the intestinal immune system. He is now an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Keio University School of Medicine. And as we saw from this paper, he's primarily interested in the interaction between between the gut microbiome and the immune system. He said a, a really exciting day um, in this project was when they did the experiment and first identified out of the complex mix of microbes in saliva of patients that there was one Klebsiella that could account for the majority of the um, Th1 cell stimulation. And as I said, they're, they're most interested now in identifying uh, beneficial bacteria that can prevent that from happening. So the advice he has for junior scientists is mm-hmm. to be curious, be patient, and enjoy science. You bet. <laughs> That's the key. Yeah. That's the key. And, yeah. Boy, yeah. as I thought about this paper, um, it reminded me of some comments that people have made in the early days of microbiome that, oh, it's just cataloging. We're just learning who's there. It's just correlations. Here we see now in a single paper that they took a patient sample were able to identify a response using a mouse model. They then took advantage of a number of genetic mutants in mice and were able to identify the key players in the immune system. And they could do the 16S analysis and identify not only the culprit bacterial species, but then go deeper and actually correlate particular metabolic pathways of the bacteria that are doing this. And then like test their model by taking yet more human samples and recapitulating uh, the biology. And they did this in one paper. Yep. <laughs> so it's it's amazing Beautiful. how fearless yep. they were and ambitious. And also I should I should add, I love the cherry on top where they went to these this registry of patients from Mass General and, and UPenn and were able to say, actually this is very consistent with the patterns that we're seeing in patient populations. So to do all of this work and publish it in one paper, wow, we've really come a long way. And hats off to this group and their highly productive collaboration. That's why there are 26 authors, I guess. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, th- it, there, it's, a, it's a service to, to the community because I think if you had to read, if they published this in pieces, because you could have published this in pieces. Figure one, as you point out, had 10 panels in it. Yeah, sure. And it, it, it really made, you, you could get the 50,000 foot level. I also like that it's a perfect use of an animal model, right? You yes. find some, and then you go into humans and you say, yeah, this looks right. right. You know, people, a lot of people criticize mouse models. They say they're useful, but this shows that they have a lot of value. 
you know. You and can, you've got it. You need specific information to then interrogate all of the clinical data and right, ask if it's right. consistent or not. So right. yeah, really beautiful the way they went back and forth between the clinical samples, the mouse model, the bacterial genetics. Yep. Good job. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. All right, we're out of time, so I'll skip the emails till next time. I just want to remind you, you can send your questions and comments to twim at microbe.tv. I also want to let you know we're starting a new immunology podcast. Wow. It's called Immune. Ooh. It's just called Immune. No more this week. <laughs> it's called Immune, and you can find it starting November 1st at microbe.tv slash immune. My colleagues in that venture are two immunologists, at Cindy Leifer from Cornell University and Stephanie Langle from Ohio State University. They're card-carrying immunologists, so it'll be authentic. Although uh, today, you see, you have to know immunology and microbiology to really understand, right? You can't just know immunology. Not, you have to know about strains and anaerobic growth, et cetera. So it's tough to split it all up. Anyway, uh, that's November 1st, microbe.tv slash immune. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the ASM for their support of TWIM, Ray Ortega for post-production, and the sponsor of this episode, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. The music you hear on TWIM is by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. See you next time this week microbiology.